Okay, I want to start by saying how much I've, I've enjoyed today. The papers I've heard have reinforced what a vibrant field um, we're dealing with when we talk about community heritage. Just to give a sense of that, I've got some sort of keywords that capture people's responses that come from people's um, papers today. People talked about enthusiasm, passion, how committed uh, volunteers and community participants are. Uh, they talked about the excitement of discovery. That came across very strongly. Um, they talked about the sort of obsessive nature of it and the personal nature of it. Um, and even sometimes how there could, it could get angry or heated, tied up with that passion. Somebody even described it, and I'll finish the last keyword, as super duper, which I thought was quite good. <laughs> I think we've also seen the extraordinary scope and breadth and depth of uh, the activities involved in community heritage. And I should just say I put slides together as a sort of backdrop to capture this, and mostly from my own projects because, of course, I didn't have access to people's images from their uh, presentations today. Um, but we've seen a whole range of activities from excavation, survey, graveyard recording, also oral history, genealogy, archival research, conservation, stewardship, restoration. Also the important role of photography and, and especially new technologies, 3D modeling, that's really come through. Drawing, painting, artistic practice and artistic engagement is also something that struck me as a theme today that was running through a lot of different projects. And that could involve poetry, painting. Of course, we've got artistic practice in the room right now with Alex Hale's sketches in the background capturing uh, the day in, a visual, in visual representations. And then, of course, the, there's the other activities, outreach, engagement, talks, films, workshops with schools, youth engagement, all those sorts of things. I think we also see, through a number of the projects that have been talked about and a number of the uh, displays as well, how community heritage, in effect, is very much part of a wider community practice and forms of community engagement. It's not, strictly speaking, a kind of just the official heritage that we might think of or the kinds of things archaeologists do. It's very much integrated with all kinds of community practice. And often because of that, it can bring together the built environment, subsurface deposits through excavation and other kinds of recording like geophysics. It can also bring together the natural and the cultural environment and the historic environment in a way that I think is very important, which of course the Living Lomans project highlights uh, that Joe Fitzpatrick was talking about. I couldn't resist slotting in uh, something of Dante's Divine Comedy, because of course community heritage can also be about theater, as Sean and Barry highlighted. There is as well an immense array of heritage places that's captured through community projects. Um, there is the sort of, again, sort of more conventional heritage sites, prehistoric monuments, burial memorials, graveyards, Pictish stones. And we see that as well as the sort of authoritative sort of historic value and aesthetic value and scientific values around that, how much sort of social and communal value there is around those kinds of sites uh, that bring about multiple narratives and ways of engaging with them. But there's also a lot of breadth there in, in terms of the scope of uh, places and material objects and also virtual objects that people might treat as heritage, allotments, a cinema, um, old, uh, an old pub, a tree uh, in the Fortingale U. Um, in effect, as well, what I think is characteristic of community heritage is the way in which it assembles objects together uh, with not just the tangible stuff, but also the intangible stuff. So it assembles objects, stories, photos, and in fact creates new heritage objects in the process as well around existing heritage places. Um, and I think, you know, we 
obviously graffiti is something that's controversial, but graffiti mark making, people want to make their mark in place. And I think it's interesting that the Raising the Bar project, for instance, had that, uh, I think it was at the bench where people could inscribe uh, their names. And I think we need to think with all this digital uh, heritage as well about the models we're making. Do they become heritage objects themselves alongside the reconstructions, uh, like in one of the 60 minute presentations, the timber circle that we heard about. So this making and assembling of heritage, I think is a key aspect, as is the creative engagement. We saw that a lot of projects are actually engaging uh, artistic practice and artists in the project and collaborating with artists. Um, but of course, it's the, also the arti artistic practice of those that are involved in the community project themselves. That's important. We've also heard through the day about the importance of schemes that support and encourage communities to conserve, research, interpret, and promote heritage sites. Uh, and a number of these schemes have been mentioned here today. Uh, the Adopt a Monument scheme was mentioned several times uh, in relation to projects that we heard about. We know that we've got the Arkham Scotland's Rural Pass project about to kick off. Um, we've also heard about the launch of the Angel Awards, the Scottish Angel Awards. Uh, and we, obviously there are other awards out there like the Scottish Civic Trust, My Place Awards, uh, the Marsh Award for Community Archaeology. There are also organisations that support capacity uh, like the Council for British Archaeology's Community Bursaries Project. And it's interesting that Hannah Baxter, who was talking about the allotment project and who's been involved in that community practice, in fact, uh, had one of those bursaries um, with the York Archaeological Trust. Funding, of course, is also crucial, and Muriel Dunbar has discussed this in relation to the reconstruction of the Burke Cinema, uh, and, and made a number of interesting points about the role of experience in making uh, funding applications, the need for support in those areas, perhaps, uh, and also a very interesting point, I think, about the importance of geographic sort of co-location in relation to donors and funders and how significant that is. But funding, of course, is a, a very important issue in terms of access uh, and resources and something I think that we probably need to look at in terms of where resources go and particularly the sort of undesignated local kinds of heritage places that might not be recognized as having a high level of national or international significance, but are, are still inevitably very important uh, locally and produce a wealth of values and benefits. In terms of this uh, promotion, I think that we've also got um, the fostering of community heritage. We've also got issues surrounding the sort of balance between expertise uh, and creativity. And I thought that came through in a lot of the papers today. I don't want to get into that sort of top-down, bottom-up polarization, because I think what we see is a, is a complex either interweaving of expertise uh, and community-led initiatives. Um, but I think it is very important that expertise is flexible and supportive and creative and responsive and open. So when experts are involved, they're very open to the way communities wish to uh, develop their relationship with heritage sites. And we're not just interested in teaching them, say, how to be proper archaeologists uh, or how to uh, sort of recognize the official stories about heritage sites. We don't want to sort of... Uh, and, and to look at the heritage sites the way maybe heritage managers might. Those things are all important, but we don't want to constrain the creativity, I think, of community practice. And of course, as a number of papers pointed out, there's community expertise. There's what communities bring to understanding those places. But I would like to highlight creativity more than anything, the way that community practice creates new stories in effect, and also new objects of heritage, as I've said. The new historic uh, environment strategy, our place in time, 
has um, an, a new sort of definition of what the historic environment can be said to be. It's the cultural heritage of places, the combination of physical things, the tangible stuff, and also the aspects we cannot see, the stories, the traditions, the concepts, the intangible stuff. And, and as you can see, I've already emphasized how important that is. I think to achieve this vision, and I think it's a very good vision, we need to open up our understandings of cultural significance when it comes to heritage to accommodate the great wealth of social values and communal values alongside what have been long-standing historic, scientific, aesthetic values in relation uh, to heritage. And I think community archaeology can really help with achieving this vision is, is one of the things that I want to say. It helps us, as I've already suggested, through talking about the range of heritage places and also the importance of the tangible and the intangible. It helps us to broaden significance um, and, and the significance of different kinds of places. And it very much helps us to link the tangible uh, and the intangible archaeologists, architectural historians, heritage managers, and so on. We've often, um, historically at least, until recently, focused very much on the things, on the objects, the heritage objects. And there is great impetus um, in professional and academic circles to want to include more of the stories, the meanings, the values uh, around this physical stuff now. But we still struggle with, I think, a tradition of focusing on the physical heritage to the detriment of the intangible aspects of it. And I think community heritage, naturally people engaged in community projects do this. As I said, they assemble stories around places. Just think going back to the Keel, uh, or actually it was the Fortingill. Uh, Kirkyard project, and I just thought a really nice example of this was the headstone, uh, and, and there was the chap from Glasgow, and I think Neil said, um, and where did the chap from Glasgow come to? Why was he buried here? And then they went off and they investigated that, and then they looked to contact the family, and the family sent a photograph. So this sort of assembling of, con of objects around a particular place and a story, and a connect the, the connections between people and places that are made, I think are key. There is, of course, also a sort of identity politics involved in community heritage, and I think we shouldn't be surprised or shy away from conflicts and tensions that might arise at times. I think those things are important, and they've been hinted at in relation to, say, the allotment project, uh, the sort of histories of protest and campaigning. They were hinted at or, or, or referenced by uh, Sean and Barry when they were talking about the sort of local politics surrounding Cumnock. Um, I think I'm right, it was Sean that was saying, well, I was from outside of Cumnock and there are these politics over the resources that go into Cumnock and they don't go into the surrounding areas. And I think these things are really important. It's also really important that people in community projects use the past to contest relationships in the present and also to try and change the present and importantly also the future. Just got two slides. And this brings me to the sort of social policy agendas um, that often are the focus of sort of let, fostering community heritage and community archaeology. Very much a focus on benefits. Um, this particular one, the all-party Westminster Parliamentary Archaeology Group. Community archaeology encouraging social inclusion, active citizenship, reinforcing a sense of community. Politicians, of course, are always very concerned with healthy communities, sense of well-being, etc. Applauded by applauding cultural diversity. Um, creating distinctiveness, promoting tourism, and of course behind that as well, economic, um, economic regeneration and so on. So, and of course these are all uh, very laudable ideals and very important, and, and some of these things can be achieved through community projects. Um, but I think again, I want to come back to the Raising the Bar project, but Sean and Barry in their presentation, I think in a sense made a very important point about 
being careful with those sorts of ideals and the wishful thinking in terms of community heritage resolving a problem like urban regeneration. Um, actually, what happens, I think, where the real value lies is in the practice of this uh, and in people working out relationships with one another. And through doing that, very much creating sort of networks of relationships, weaving people, places, and things together across space and time. And that's not just about connecting communities in the past with communities in the present, communities in the present with each other, places in the present with each other, but of course it's also about the future. But I think, I, I hope and I think today's very much illustrated this, that community heritage is a place where people can define their own visions about the future. Uh, and I think, it, especially in a post-referendum Scotland, that's going to be very important that it isn't seen to be uh, something that's led by politics with a capital P, that it's something people do for themselves. Thanks very much.